Hello? 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 Okay, I have audio. Uh, so, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Museum Architecture and to this lecture by Joss Boyce. Uh, and it's a real treat and pleasure to have you all, of, all here today. Uh, this talk is part of the public programming series for our exhibition, Coming Into Community, which is the National Museum's contribution to this year's Oslo Architecture Triennial. My name is Victoria Bugaya. I'm a curator of architecture here at the museum, and I'm also the curator of this show. <clears throat> so this year, 2022, Norway celebrates uh, that it is 50 years since the decriminalization of male homosexuality. And the Queer Culture Year is an initiative from the National Museum, the National Library, and the Queer Archives at the University of Bergen. And it was initiated as a way to create momentum around this shared responsibility to advance queer art, culture, history, and to support queer uh, artists and audiences. So a particularly important question for us, going into the themes of this year's triennial, Mission Neighborhood Reforming Communities, has been how urban planning looks from queer, feminist, and other marginalized perspectives. That is, for people who have historically fallen outside of the norm. Uh, in our exhibition here at the National Museum Architecture, you can see some historical examples of this in our show. You can also experience the installation by Swedish art and architecture collective Mycket based on queer nightclubs. Uh, for so many, the place where they first found their community and their home. Today, uh, we are going to continue our public programming with a talk by Joel Sanders on queer architecture at 3 p.m., followed by a conversation between Joel and the Oslo-based collective Exutoire. Um, this is fully booked, but will also be live streamed. Um, and you, you know, if you show up, there might be some last minute seats. Uh, starting at six tonight, there will be a performative artist talk with Mikket, followed by a party with DJs and performances from the drag and ballroom scene in Oslo. Uh, Mikket's walkthrough closet, as well as our drag queens and drag king, will be available for styling and makeup advice all night. Um, and we're also hosting a poster workshop all day today and tomorrow inside of Mikit's installation. This is open for everyone, so please take the time to stop by. Um, during the fall, we have a film screening series based on some of the themes from the exhibition. Uh, one of the films we're showing, for example, is Call Me Kuchu, which features the bar Sapo Islands in Kampala, which is also part of our exhibition downstairs here. Uh, and then finally, we also have our children's programming. I would like to highlight Alex in Mikitlan by Remy Johansen Hovda, which is a site-specific drag storytelling tour in Mikit's installation, uh, which is all about transformation and adventure. So, but back to today's talk, why you're all here right now. Uh, it's very special that we get to have Joss Boyce as our guest today. She's become somewhat of an Oslo friend. She's been to Rome um, Gallery uh, already to visit. Um, she is a scholar, an activist, I would argue, uh, who have consistently stayed in the forefront of her field. First as a feminist designer and co-founder of the London-based collective Matrix, and then as one of the leading voices in how to think both critically and creatively about disability and architecture. She is a professor at the Bartlett Faculty of Built Environment at the University College of London, and since 2008, she has been co-director of the Disordinary Architecture Project, together with artist Zoe Partington. So the work of Matrix really pioneered ideas of co-designing and brought in radical new ideas of who architecture should be for, who it should serve, and how architects could work to facilitate that. Uh, the Barbican in London had a retrospective of Matrix last year, and uh, this year, their 1984 book, Making Space, was republished uh, by Verso, 
Uh, we tried to get this book in our bookshop, but it is already sold out from the publishing house. So try to get your hands on it, if you can, wherever you see it. Uh, but I think this is also a testament to how uh, important, vibrant, and still kind of uh, pressing uh, many of Matrix ideas and critiques were. Uh, so Joss is going to talk for about 45 minutes, is that correct? Yeah. And then we'll have some time for questions after. Um, if you're watching this lecture through our live stream, you can ask questions in the comments field and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So, with no uh, further delays, please welcome Joss Boyce. Okay, super. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria, and thank you everyone for coming. And um, it's really lovely to be here and have the exhibition and see all the work um, in the museum here. So that's uh, very exciting. I, um, I always feel when I'm talking about Matrix that it's a little under false pretenses. So I have to start by explaining something about the fact that, and it's very true for a lot of those... Um, uh, precarious community-based practices. It's still the case, but particularly if you're thinking about the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, um, uh, we weren't a generation who thought about keeping things, really, and, uh, and there wasn't, you know, an internet to put them on. And so um, the work that's here was in people's uh, boxes under people's beds and cupboards and attics and in, in, in kind of paper plastic bags for years and years. Some of it kept, some of it thrown away. And we only just started getting it together um, almost by accident, I guess about two years ago. And so what you see there is just kind of, oh my God, who's got stuff? And then that adds to the second thing that I need to say about that. Um, it happens to be me because I happen to have time in my job compared to other people to be able to do this work or to get some small amount of funding to do this work. But it was already true we didn't know where everybody was. Uh, we didn't know uh, whether people wanted to be involved. You know, Matrix, this is just, this isn't even the full list of people. This was our initial list, trying to work out who had worked for Matrix in the kind of 10 years from 81 to 94 that it had been operating. So I happen to be the one standing here, but there's just a very diverse range of people. Some of these women, have they just left, you know, um, uh, political protest and, and uh, some of the exhaustion of trying to work in a feminist way means that they've, they've disappeared off the face of the earth. They don't want to talk about any of it. The brilliant woman who made the film Paradise Circus, which has a piece downstairs, I still can't find her or get in touch with her. Um, so there's a really wide range of uh, attitudes about whether this material should be um, archived, how it should be archived, uh, whether uh, what stories should be told about Matrix, you know, why, why is this happening? And... Um, and there's time, and there's memory, uh, and there's uh, just a whole variety of things that uh, I want to, in a way, I want that to be part of the mix. Part of the mix is to say, Matrix is not some sort of foundational moment. It's, it was part of a whole set of things that were happening in that period, and it relates to, in all sorts of ways, a whole set of things that are happening, have happened since, and are happening in this period. So we don't want to be seen as like, oh my God. <laughs> They were so special. It, there isn't, you know, it's just a set of things that were going on. And it came out of this meeting, which is in my front room, uh, I should think in 2018, um, where we, we, got, we were still, some of us were still getting together on and off over the years. And we found that we were all getting requests from students, from uh, educators, from architects, from other scholars for the book. The book had stopped, the Pluto Press had gone bust, it hadn't been reprinted, and so we got together to think about getting the book reprinted. Um, and actually that happened almost uh, as a sideline, but I'll come back to that. And that meant 
trying to find a whole lot of other people. And the, the group that you saw sitting in that room tended to be people who'd been involved in the early days and involved in the book group. But there were a, later cohorts who did amazing work in much more difficult times when the political... Um, situation in the UK under the Thatcher government and a Conservative government changed, changed radically. So suddenly they were trying to do community-based practice in much more difficult, and feminist practice in much more difficult situations. And those women too have been amazing in terms of finding material, talking about their experiences, and enabling us to build a kind of record, uh, quite a diverse record, and different voices and perspectives on what Matrix did. So then I'm getting complicated a bit more because uh, all those different women obviously have, uh, they've had lives since and done other things and Matrix was always interested in um, teaching, in research, in developing new kinds of practices, in networking and events, in other kinds of promotional publications and polemics. So this is just something, a kind of, uh, and actually, this is now quite dated, but this was, again, us just trying to get that sense of the wide range of things that were going on. So although it seems back to front in that I am going to talk about what Matrix actually did, I just want to put it in this broader context. And one context is the things that have happened since, because they are all um, unexpected, and they do come out of a sense that there's a real resurgence of interest in this uh, uh, internationally, and also a real resurgence in uh, people doing, trying, doing similar things now, but with a very different societal context, and therefore with different gaps and opportunities. So the two kind of key things that have sort of escalated, I'm going to say escalated, the situation in terms of Matrix becoming much more well-known um, internationally, is one that we decided we'd do an open access archive. So we would try and do something that modelled the practice, and again, I'll talk about it in a minute, modelled the practice uh, as a way of working, which is, um, it's still a completely unfinished site, but on it you will find lots and lots of uh, resources and artefacts. All the artefacts in the show, not quite all of them, but almost all of them, you can find and print out yourself. They're there for you. And... There have been exhibitions that have developed out of that where people have just taken what they need. So the aim is that it becomes something that grows and develops with other people adding stuff and that we add stuff relating to things that are happening now. So one thing is the archive and then the other is this show at the exhibition, which Victoria mentioned, um, this exhibition at the Barbican, uh, which was designed by uh, Edit Collective and which was co-created curated by the Barbican uh, art, architecture and design curator John Astbury and uh, which was a truly wonderful and truly hilarious thing and again the installation was designed before we had any stuff we had an idea we might be able to find some stuff but we didn't actually have it so it was done in a very uh, what I think of in a very kind of co-design kind of matrix fashion really and again although I won't talk about this so many different people involved. So it's, it's really, it's very relevant to me that I just happen to be the one here, but it's not really the point. Uh, and Victoria also mentioned the book, and I, I'm sorry that you can't get it here, but I know that this discount is, I checked this morning, this discount is still there if anybody wants to get it. Those who are very good at doing, they, uh, of doing discounts because they want to sell lots of books. And so that's been fantastic that um, they republished it as a feminist classic. So that's quite a big preamble just to start, but it's, I feel like I do need to do it every time I talk about Matrix. So what's going on here? What, what was it in the London context in the 1970s that generated a whole group of women who really... Uh, and very diverse women who just felt that there were real problems, you know, that who were becoming feminists and who were very um, concerned to try and work out what it was about the design of the built environment, what it was about architecture, the way that architecture was taught, what it was about the way that architecture and related professions were practiced that was gendered. And 
that was into an environment where it was kind of assumed that the built environment was neutral, that, you know, that it wasn't gendered, and the word sexism didn't really exist. So there wasn't a way of articulating it very well. And I think we were very influenced, and this is a group of mainly white, mainly middle-class young women who'd managed to get into, they'd moved, we'd moved into higher education in the kind of post-war period in the UK in much larger numbers than previously, even into architecture where there were still very few women. And a lot of the Anglo-American discussion was about the problems for the middle-class white housewife. So it was about this idea, and I love this image, because she manages somehow to be cooking this dinner in her evening dress, <laughs> drinking a cup of tea. Um, and again, there's lots of work about how this came to be. But that was kind of the, it was like, what's, what's going on there? And how does that have an impact in terms of how houses are designed, how family groups are understood? This comes up so wonderfully in the show. How understandings about heterosexuality and, and uh, other gender positions are uh, played out. And... How does it relate to the design of public space further on? What's going on? And that was really the book came out of us, a group of us just being like, trying to work that out, actually just trying to work that out. And we were, of course, very influenced by a lot of brilliant um, British feminists from the period. This is Sheila Rowbottom. I love this quote because it was that sense that, that uh, many women uh, were felt like they were lumbering around ungainly like in borrowed concepts which did not feel fit the shape we felt ourselves to be. We felt like misfits. We felt like there was an idea of what you were meant to do. You might be able to go to education, but then somehow you would become a housewife, you'd look after a home, you'd have kids. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of that. I'm just saying it was kind of, it was as if it was just obvious that that's what you would do. And it became a real tension for many, many women and led to, um, as I did in many countries, to um, protests in the UK. And again, actually, I think Oslo was in quite a similar condition. London in the 1970s and 80s was almost entirely derelict. It was very, um, it was unoccupied. There were great swathes of London now that are very uh, gentrified, that were just empty. And, uh, so, and, and so there was a lot of squatting going on, though we, and especially those of us who were into architecture school. It was like a way of reclaiming properties that um, the local government was trying to knock down and replace with motorways and office blocks and kind of change the nature of London. And... There were also many women who hadn't had anything to do with architecture. Uh, there were quite a lot of um, lesbian co-ops where women took over buildings to get a different way of living together and then learnt building skills and then learnt design skills and then went to architecture school. So it was this kind of really... And, and several of the women in Matrix had had that route. They'd already become... They'd worked as social workers or they'd worked in other ways um, and then they would uh, became really interested in architecture that way. But there was also a, a setting where, which was already quite politicised within architectural education. So on this side, at the Architectural Association, which is kind of a really uh, uh, very well-known private school in, in London, uh, the students went out and campaigned with local people, the kind of saving Covent Garden from the developers. Um, if crime doesn't pay where do architects get all their money? It was a kind of real critique of the architectural profession, really um, savage critique of the architecture profession. And on the other side, um, a magazine called Slate, which was organised by something called the New Architecture Movement, which was trying to uh, unionise architects. It was basically saying, the thing is, you, you get told that creativity is everything, and then you get paid a very poor wage, and you get exploited. So there, were, there was a lot going on uh, that we connected into. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the things around Matrix and, and what kinds of approaches it took. So the first thing is that it was organised as a collective and everybody got paid the same and decision making was done together, um, which meant there were a lot of meetings. Uh, and... Um, 
there were various, uh, there were kind of various ways of enabling uh, people who had women who had children to that childcare wasn't like an extra expense and it wasn't something you just had to pretend wasn't something that you dealt with. Um, so there were a range of ways of trying to operate together that were um, equitable. Um, in fact, it led to quite a lot of tensions, but we can talk about that if anybody wants to ask. And then, uh, which is still there, interestingly, when you talk to people now. Um, so, uh, and then we did a lot of kind of promotional materials. Obviously, this is a, a page a spread from inside the book, but we did a lot of pamphlets. Um, we were really interested in how you might share the kind of approaches and the knowledge that uh, saw um, the way that architecture might work as a process differently. Then there was a really strong link, and again, I don't know what the situation was here so much, but a very strong link with construction and with a group called Women in the Manual Trades. So there was in parallel, there was a group of, uh, there was a lot of work going on about more women wanting to get into construction and it being a very male-dominated discipline. So quite a lot of the women in Matrix also trained in one of the trades. Um, uh, this is Sue Francis, who became a bricklayer. Um, uh, Anne-Marie Ascott, who became a, a, a joiner. Uh, but we also had originally trained as architects. So there was a lot of overlap in thinking that rather than having these as two separate professions with a real class division. You know, the middle class, you become an architect. Working class, you might get into the building trades. That those, those divisions needed also to be challenged and that the way that buildings were designed needed to be much more integrated. And then the final picture here, which is of the Jaganari building, which is downstairs, was about a whole way of working directly with users um, in a kind of co-creation process. So using... Uh, models that you could pull apart. Uh, this, is, uh, this was made later, so it's not really accurate. Um, all the models, of course, if you could pull them apart, they have fallen apart since then. We often get asked, oh, have you got any of the original models? It's like, no. Um, so, uh, uh, but the idea was that you could kind of make, uh, you could explore those things. And there were a lot of... Um, there was always work around how to, what plans were, and sections, what all the kind of design tools were, and a lot of work around measurement and scale. So in every case, whatever room the users were working in, they would measure that, and then that would become a scale. The size and shape of the room would become a scale for understanding uh, design possibilities. So there was just some, and they were all really simple. There was nothing fancy about any of this. They were very simple techniques, but they recognised that there's a big divide between the way that you learn to represent built space and architect and the way you experience space as, um, a, a, particularly as a marginalised, somebody who might be marginalised in space. So that was, those are the kinds of, the four kinds of aspects. And then I think part of that, so, what was it, what needed to change about the design of the built environment? Some of that I've already talked about, the middle class housewife and the kind of the design of the home and the kitchens and um, how they made assumptions about who was doing what. But also, of course, the uh, public realm, uh, very inaccessible um, and uh, depending, you know, because women were given roles of looking after children, then that had and often didn't have access to cars. Uh, that was um, something that was needed investigating. And what we want to do with that is, is kind of have some way of understanding it strategically and structurally. So not just, you know, oh, what a pity, but actually thinking about how uh, one could have a proper critique um, that in, in relationship to the design of the built environment. So some of that was around looking at what was already available to read and think about. And there was absolutely nothing really about architecture and feminism in that period, but there were some very interesting feminist geographers, um, architectural historians in the States, uh, writing about um, the history of, of women in the home. And we read those vicariously. We were just really excited by that. And then we increasingly began to try and think about ways of uh, analysing and then critiquing the kind of tools that 
normative architectural professionals were using. So these both are images from design guides, government design guides from the 1980s. One called Space in the Home, that one, and this one, I can't remember what that was called, but it was called, it was about a housing estate, the external spaces of housing estates. And, um, and they were hilarious. I mean, I, you know, it's like, um, these were kind of representing a stereotypical version of society that was already changing beyond recognition. So you can see here, uh, if you can see at the back, in the middle over the sink, the, there's a black figure, a woman, and you'll notice that she doesn't really ever leave the sink, except when she's hoovering. <laughs> and the man, uh, I don't know which is, so he moves around quite a lot. He goes off, uh, which, you know, that also has its issues, but he goes off. And, and in fact, I haven't shown the second shot, but in the second shot, he comes home. She's still at the sink. He comes in, he walks part, he's, and then in the next shot, he's sitting in front of the television. And she's making the dinner at the back. So it's a kind of really wonderful expression of an assumed reality, uh, and in many cases, I think a lived reality uh, for some women, of what the home was designed around. And so it became very, and it's in, in one of the pieces in the book uh, by Sue Francis, is about um, how you could challenge that. And on this side, which comes from a piece that I wrote for the book, it was about this kind of idea that if you made interesting spaces... The people's relationship to space was, was kind of like a magnet. It was like, ooh, must be something interesting round that corner. I'll go there, as if that's how you move around space. And, and of course, the reality of that is, especially if you're female or another marginalised group, is you wouldn't just go round that corner to see what there might be. It's a kind of madness, but it's a madness that's built into a set of assumptions about who goes where, who is valued, what they're doing, and... Um, how that's translated into design. So it was possible from those kinds of guides to begin to unpick assumptions. And I mentioned the book, the reason I put the, uh, the original version in is this is from the Bartlett School of Architecture Library. Uh, somebody who I will not name stole it from me, for me, from that library, because you can see that it's been very well read. They bought a first edition in the 1980s. It's completely, I still have this copy, it's got felt tip underlining in pencil, it's got post-it notes, it's completely covered. It just, and it's got, because it used to be one of those things where you had to stamp every time you borrowed it, the sticky labels in the front are so thick that you can't actually close the cover. So I think what was really beautiful about that to me was how the interest was still going on. People were borrowing this book, they were reading it really thoroughly, and the only issue was really why the, Barbican, or why the Bartlett didn't buy, you know, another copy or two. So I've talked about those different things that we did, and the, the kind of sense, you know, and it comes up from how I began about this being very much about opening up debate and trying to discuss things and trying to work out together a kind of version of you know, feminist consciousness raising. How do you work out what's going on and then how do you challenge it? It was seen very much as something which was about engaging as many people as possible. And we had, there were always events about different aspects to kind of, um, of, of discussions that were being had that were really just trying to explore and debate those things. Um, and here's one, you know, around women in buildings. So, again, kind of... Uh, not just exploring it through discussion, but also having uh, workshops and um, opportunities for training. And I did want to call out man and women in the manual trades because those connections aren't made to the same extent, in the UK anyway, I don't know if here, but women in the manual trades is still going. It's still a really important organisation for women who do want to uh, be, uh, have a building trade. And I, for me, that's kind of a really, um, it's kind of a vital thing. Those kinds of connections often get forgotten, I think, in the current period. And part of that, this was one of these promotional pamphlets that I was talking about, a job designing buildings. It didn't differentiate between becoming an architect, becoming a surveyor, becoming a planner, becoming a builder. It, it was trying to say that all those jobs, we need more women into all of those jobs, and all those jobs are relevant. 
So there wasn't a kind of... It was very de deliberately refusing a kind of class division. Um, and there were, of course, lots and lots of leaflets. Uh, Matrix was quite good at promotion. So let me talk just a bit about this, a bit more about these different design methods. Um, so this is a model... Uh, which is much more accurate. I don't know where you know this model didn't survive, but it's a much more accurate version of how models were used. This is Dalston Children's Centre. So this one's quite chunky, but the aim is that you can yeah that you can really begin to move things around and take them out and replace them with other things and get a sense of what the space was like. So this was the co-design model with the clients of that children's centre, and it was a very radical uh, children's centre. Um, and then this is, um, this is actually from Paradise Circus, but this is uh, the clients for Jaganari with Anne Thorne and many of the different things that happened with that building. Some of them are downstairs, but, you know, this is one of the... It was about really having very rich but very straightforward ways of involving the users in discussions about what the building would be like. And this is, um, was called a brick picnic. So everybody went off with the kids and a picnic and argued over the colours of bricks and the colour of mortar and what you might want and why you would choose it. And that was how the um, colour was chosen. And that's uh, Jaganari, which again you see downside, downstairs. And the, um, so there's that mixture of trying to be um, expressive about uh, the occupants, but also recognising that this was a time uh, where this bit of East London... Um, people were having, uh, people of colour were having, you know, letter bombs put through their letter boxes. So this is actually um, security protection. And then a much later scheme, I put this in because I feel like it uh, shows how in the later years of Matrix, they were working in so much more difficult circumstances. So there was much less funding. A lot of the funding in the early days from the, was from the Great London Council. And they, um, uh, they, fit, they didn't just fund projects. You had to, so Matrix did one of the key things they did, really, was that they helped people tender for money. They helped people get money from... They'd help them write a bid, and, and they'd often help them to really develop their ambitions. So uh, with Jaganari, they originally assumed they'd just get um, a porter cabin, you know, just a, like a container. And in fact, they ended up with a very large building. Um, but they also uh, provided money for feasibility studies. So a feasibility study was where you could work with an architect and develop what your project. As a community group, you could develop your project. Um, you had the advice to help you do that. And for that to be funded is extraordinary because it makes it much more possible for poor people to have a say in, in the buildings that they want. It's kind of a really key thing. And that got cut, and then it got, uh, it got shared out among the London boroughs, and then that got cut. And then it became, anyway, harder in terms of regulations to talk directly with users. So this building, so there's the same technique still used. Uh, this is um, a women's refuge in Harlow in Essex uh, that was a redesign of a building that had been done. The clients came because they, they'd had a male architect who they said just treated it as if it was kind of an institution for... Um, treated the women very badly, so they asked to change it. But So this was a kind of exactly the same way of working in this very shared way, but uh, it was much harder to work with the users, and that wasn't because they were women fleeing domestic violence. It was literally because it, you now only had the time and the funding to work with the client body, with the Housing Association. So they were working in much more difficult circumstances. Uh, and the, the outside of this building relates to what it was already designed like, um, and there was no opportunity to change that. But they made some really interesting moves inside in terms of how they organised the kitchens. And again, you can see this is modelled to help people really see what's going on. So I'm very happy to answer any questions about Matrix as it existed and all the different things about it. But I do also want to talk about um, what's happened since, both to Matrix and to some of the work that I've been doing and some of the work that other women in Matrix have been doing so that it's not just this one special thing. Uh, and, but I also want to explore why um, 
there's been this kind of resurgence of interest. I'm really interested in that. And this is the Wikipedia page for Matrix, which is probably, I don't know, three years old, four years old. And again, that's kind of like, oh, <laughs> OK. So, there's, you know, it's, it's, uh, things get rediscovered. And it's kind of, I just have to say, when you're rediscovered, when you're in the group that's rediscovered, it's a very peculiar feeling to be rediscovered. Um, and you know, treated as if something special. Uh, so there's that. And then I mentioned the show at the Barbican, the Matrix show at the Barbican, which John Asprey, unfortunately, <laughs> he flew out yesterday. He should be here, really. Um, was fantastic on. Uh, was a way of just trying to capture. So that also just has Matrix, but it has things that happened afterwards. It puts in some of the contextual materials. And I just wanted to give you a flavour of how that space worked um, in the setting of uh, a much larger arts centre. Uh, and also it was, um, I mean, it, I don't know how we managed it really, because it was mid-pandemic. We, we weren't ever sure when we were going to be op able to open. And then when we did open, we had to limit the number of people who came uh, and we had sanitizers everywhere. There was a kind of lot of issues about whether we'd be able to open it. And one of the things that was done in parallel with that in order to make it interest, you know, usable by people who couldn't actually attend was uh, something that um, Edit Collected did, which was this really wonderful, instead of a catalogue, they did a kind of pack of activities. And the reason, again, I'm mentioning this is it's, it's in this whole ethos about opening things up about giving choices, about having variety, uh, but about always asking questions. It's always like, we don't know what the answer is, we're going to keep asking questions, we're going to come up with some critique, but always it's, what is going on here? Who is being valued? Who has power? And for me, that connects very much to the work I've been doing more recently uh, around disability and in thinking about disability in a very different way, not just in terms of a kind of functional access that you deal with in relationship to building codes, but as something that's very creative, that's a creative generator, that's a critique of the normative. So in a way, recognising that disability um, is there with queer studies, it's there with feminist studies, it's not different, and it's treated differently. It's still treated very differently, as if it's a kind of a historical, a cultural, just a kind of functional problem in architecture. It hasn't become part of, uh, it's being left out often in relationship to um, those more radical practices. Uh, I will read that. To promote activity that develops and captures models of new practice for the built environment led by the creativity and experiences of disabled artists. And as uh, Victoria said, this is with a disabled artist called Zoe Partington, but we work, we bring disabled artists in different ways into architectural practice and education. Uh, and you can see it's about new modes of practice, just as with Matrix, it's not, you know, somehow these design solutions, you know, design solutions for women or design solutions for people with disabilities. It is challenging the very way that architecture is set up as a process, the way that you learn to do it if you're studying it, the way that it's practiced um, and the way that it's funded and organised politically. And my key quote from that is from a really brilliant disability studies activist called um, Rosemary Garland Thompson. And she writes, a misfit occurs when world fails flesh in the environment one encounters. So she sees you're not disabled until the world that you're in doesn't work for you. And this notion of misfitting, I think, is a very important one. I'm not going to talk any more about disordinary because time is going on. But what I would like to talk about is what's happened since. So I'm a kind of, and this is really, again, this is about opening it up to you in terms of what's happened here, but also what you feel has happened since. So these are all, um, that's that, from that earlier period, um, and about ideas about what it is to be female and who gets valued, but also about ideas about um, what it is to be female and working in architecture. And this is a, um, I think it's probably, it is from the 1980s, a drawing by Janice Goodman, who's another person who went to go and live in deepest Wales 
and refuses to talk to anybody, but is a ma was an amazing cartoonist. And then this is by uh, Louis Hellman, and it's about you know how architects don't listen to their users. So there's a kind of set of things that Matrix was trying to challenge, which have shifted and changed, I think. I don't think they're the same, but the issue is how much have they changed? And, and uh, what do we still need to be you know, challenging and pushing against? And Miketa, they were already on my slide, Miket. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to, again, um, honour the amount of work that's going on currently in this field. It's not, you know, there is so much going on. The top two pictures are uh, by what was called uh, Anne Thorne Architects, and two of the women who were very central to the setting up of Matrix, Anne Thorne and Fran Bradshaw, went on to set up their own women-only practice and have just been building beautiful buildings ever since. But like they're not, they're not, you know, famous, but they've just been doing it. And this is the latest one, which is a really lovely housing scheme for a, a cooperative for older people in Colchester. So that's it. There are other ways also. They decided to do it in a way that wasn't explicitly political, but they've just gone on doing proper architectural work with a, with a feminist element, just quietly which I think I really like. And then we have some other really amazing stuff. I just put uh, Black Females for Architecture in there because there's a, some really uh, exciting groups developing in the UK. And I mentioned the new architecture movement early on about unionising architects and really challenging conditions of um, overwork, uh, needing to be obsessive, always you know, somehow being very fit, never, never having time to process anything. The, and the section of architectural workers, um, which is about two years old, is doing a very similar thing. They're just really, so it's come back, if you like, that idea that we really need to challenge literally the way that architects' uh, work is organised. I'm not going to talk about these because time is going on. Um, so I just wanted to do a little call out for the archive. The, it's still unfinished, but I think it will probably be finished this year or maybe into next year because um, there's no money and no time. Uh, but And the way that we've done it, we've done it in a deliberately really old-fashioned way, which I know a lot of people will completely hate, but it's me and an old mate of mine who's a database developer, and we just decided we'd... And it's really because we didn't want any gizmos. We wanted it to be something that will just... The archive bit will just survive even if nobody looks after it. And the trouble with a lot of, you know, as web technologies develop, that's hard. But at the same time, it has sections which are called um, Explore and Collaborate, which are basically blogs. And so we begin to develop these blogs, and we've, we've just currently got our first guest moderator. So the idea is that we ask people to volunteer to moderate it for six months or something. And so it's alive. And what's in it is really... Something that connects, that uses Matrix as a jumping off point, but that connects to it and just becomes, and, and has uh, text too, has readings. So it's somewhere where you can go, see what's going on, see what people are thinking about, and find out some of the key readings uh, as they develop. Anybody in the room who'd like to be a guest editor sometime, a guest moderator, love to speak to you. <laughs> um, uh, the whole business of suddenly finding you're in charge of an archive, whether it's online or physical, is, is again, really weird. We can talk about that. And the other thing, uh, sorry, we jumped past one, um, that's come out of that, this sense that the archive needs to be open ac access and that it needs to be in this, uh, within this ethos, is that we have had... People have taken the work and done shows without telling us. It's fine, that's part of the deal. People have told us that they've made shows, but they've made completely different... It's, they're not necessarily about Matrix. They've made completely different um, interpretations. Uh, and, uh, and there are other... It, it felt it's... We're getting invited to talk in places where people have um, done things that are similar. So I'm finding out a lot internationally about... Uh, work that's been going on in the past and is going on now, which is fabulous. So I guess I just want to end on that notion that this sense of a resurgence, this sense that something, that there's a real groundswell of interest in these areas and that I'm 
you know, I'd really like, I'd, I'm very happy to have any sort of questions, but I also think that the thing to take away is what are the gaps and opportunities now? What are the things that need to happen now? And how, how do we do that? So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Just. That was fantastic. Um, we are monitoring the feed, is that what you say? The comment section. So if you've got any questions, you can ask them online. And we will take questions from the audience right now. Or comments. Or comments. <laughs> no need to be shy. <laughs> Everyone's very friendly. <laughs> Yeah, Alma? Hello. I think you have to use the mic because we're recording. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Alma Oftedal. Um, I have uh, uh, been giving a course at the Oslo Architecture School of Architecture called uh, A Queer Look at Architecture. Uh, so I'm so thrilled to hearing your speech today. Uh, I'm wondering about something when you talk about the dis disability project. Um, and it is also linked to the uh, feminist project uh, uh, when you involve, uh, uh, insist on involving users. Yeah. Um, what are your experiences uh, with work, working with people who uh, does apparently not have a voice? <laughs> Might it be because of language troubles, uh, traumatic experiences or uh, mental disabilities? Yeah, that's a really good question because I think the, the, there's uh, two aspects to that. One is the range of disabled artists that we work with, and it varies across different projects, who does what. Um, uh, and in the UK, disability arts is a very vibrant field. There's a lot of really talented artists. I mean, we're not talking art therapy, we're talking really talented artists. And, and many of those are uh, nonverbal or they have mental health problems, or, or um, yeah, there may be other things. Uh, there may be things about processing. There may be things about chronic pain, where, you know, in terms of being able to perform, like, oh, for a long period of time. And I think that um, what we, we, and I don't say we've got it right yet, but we have a whole lot of protocols in how we work. I mean, just as Matrix did, but in our case, it's about recognising that things need often to go more slowly, that you need to build in reflection, that you need to build in ways of working that do not rely on, you know, the verbal, you know, like... There's a reliance in, in a situation like this, which is that everybody will have the confidence to say, I've got something I want to say in front of this group of people who I've got no idea about, and I don't know if I'm saying the right thing. You know, we have a setup which values a particular way of being, and Disordinary tries um, not to do that. And we try and do that as modelling a form of practice that would be good for everybody, that if we had more ways of working. And then the second thing is about the tools and techniques that you use for... Uh, doing versions of co-design that aren't the ones that, that are different to the ones that are used conventionally in architectural practice. So we're really, uh, so in terms of making um, uh, installations or making pieces, so making non-verbal you know, non expressions through making, um, through performance, which uh, through, uh, and for some people, um, audio description, like text is just really unsatisfactory, but audio description is very valuable. So we try and have a range of ways of communicating that don't value only the visual, which architecture does, and don't overvalue the thing that I'm doing now, and I'm the one that does it because I'm the one that's good at it, the whole performative thing. Hi, everybody. You know, we don't, it's like, Make, not assuming that that's where you start from. Um, and we don't, as I say, we often don't get it right, but that's the kind of aim. And we do, we try and get uh, people to be paid enough so that if they need to take more time to process or they need re recovery time, that that's part of their payment. Um, 
We, uh, we organise rooms, so there's always somewhere to lie down and somewhere to escape. In, in our talks, there's usually um, lots of different ways to be. Uh, so, yeah, and I don't, yeah, I feel like, and that to me is what's quite radical about it. It's like if you start from that kind of, uh, from the outliers, for the people who normally get completely excluded, if you start by making spaces and events and processes that come from what those people are good at and where their creativity lies, then you can, um, we're, you know, that's, a, that's to the benefit of everybody, I guess. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. I represent here a Slovak collective, Spolka, who is non-hierarchical, so we were wondering what are your ver views on non-hierarchical work in a collective, <laughs> uh, of course, and then maybe uh, whether you found out that maybe some uh, different kind of uh, working together is maybe more suitable for today. I think that's such a good question. And I've also had people ask about whether today it's easier, for example, you know, that you can imagine uh, collectives that are, that are male and female. I mean, we're not even talking about gender, you know, um, non gender non-binary, or we're just talking about, you know, whether men can be involved and whether that's, things have changed enough. In terms of non-hierarchical, I mean, I never worked, I was involved in the very early design schemes before the design practice was set up as a proper practice. We didn't have a job that we could count and then I didn't work for that practice. So I never worked for the practice. So what was very interesting for me about suddenly being the person responsible for getting the archive together and we did, what we did get funding for was to interview everybody. We didn't interview everybody, but we interviewed 12 of the women, I think, um, and quite extended interviews, just about everything. And... The thing that came up again and again, one thing that came up was that everybody thought it was a fantastic experience, it was the most amazing experience. But the second thing was always real tensions around um, non-hierarchical working and uh, payment, the same payment. And that was very varied, like for some people, um, you know, a lot of the early, the first generation, and I speak this as a, as a white middle class woman coming into this, is it wasn't that they had money, but we could all live very cheaply. We were squatting and we, you know, we, and, and London was an incredibly cheap place to live. And you could survive on a low wage. You could survive on not very much money. And then, but there were women who came in who didn't have that kind of comfort of having funding, you know, having, a, you know, money or they needed... Um, or they were supporting somebody else. And so already everybody being paid the same was quite complex. And some women came with a lot of experience and they felt like that wasn't being valued. And at the same time, some women came um, as trainees who felt that a lot was being asked of them and that it was basically terrifying. So there were all these kind of complications. And there were complications, um, for example... Uh, some, some of the lesbian women were like, um, you know, if you've got children, there's a kind of built-in system to support that. The children would come along and everybody would look after them. But if you were gay, the kind of, the kind of life that you had, you know, it was like that. But there was, somehow weren't any allowances made. There weren't an allowance. I mean, you know, there wasn't a kind of sense of recognition of how that might also have effects on your income levels. So um, it was incredibly fraught, really, really fraught. And... and got discussed, I think, in meetings very, very regularly. But they kept it up the whole time. And at the end, when they were really struggling to keep going, all the women had other jobs in order to survive to do it. So that's, I noticed I'm talking about the money and the not and the hierarchy, but uh, I think it, I th the trouble is I think it has, it, it's only doable with a certain sort of privilege, I think. Uh, or a certain willingness to self-exploit. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a solution to that, but I'm very clear that the women involved in it, they, 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 they agreed with it theoretically, but in practice they hated it. And maybe I hope to talk to you afterwards. It's clearly something that I'd be interested in what you're, how you're dealing with that problem. Any further questions? We got a little bit more time. Yeah, I, 
I'm uh, Jert Ruf, uh, the director at the Oslo-based platform uh, Room for Art and Architecture. Um, I recognize what you're saying from, as a, either you speak of feminism, queer or now disability, you say at the end something about gap, what's not yet discussed, and I recognize that in your practice throughout the many years. Dare you say something about the gaps you haven't spoken of yet? Um, yes, I can. I mean, I, I, and I begin, people may have different views on this, and I, I'm talking very much about, I think, the London situation. So, uh, there were a whole lot of things that came together in the 1980s in London, in being able to live very cheaply, in a lot of community-based com campaigning and action, in... Um, having space, literally having buildings that needed converting, having money from the, the local authority to do that, to be able to pay to do it, so that Matrix could run as a practice, as a radical practice that was making money out of doing that, you know, developing new building types with very different sorts of users and with the time to actually work with those users to co-design and co-develop. Um, uh, in a very rich way, in a very rich, reflective, uh, process-driven way. And for me, since then, uh, all the people that I know, the younger people I know in architecture in London, the way, and a lot of them are doing radical practice of very different sorts, but it's all like, what I, you know, a side ha hassle, hustle? Sorry, sorry, hassle. hustle, that's interesting two words in English that are very alike. Um, and uh, often very self-exploitative. I've just, disordinary, I've just combined with another group, a really brilliant group who do a lot of stuff around waste and recycling called uh, Refabricate. And we, uh, we went for a job for the London Festival of Architecture to do some in interventions next year, which is a job I didn't really want because I could see that there was no money in it. And I said to them, when we first went for the initial bid, I'm like, this is so underfunded, I don't know why you want to do it. And they said, oh, you think we're going to pay ourselves? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yes, I think, you know, we have a rule. None of the disabled artists ever do anything if they're not paid. <laughs> it's a rule. Uh, but so, they, you know, it's that whole thing where there's a huge amount going on, but it's in these little spaces. And it's as much as anything, it's because people's rents are so high in London that everybody's got to have a paying occupation. So the gaps become very different. They become smaller, they become much more social media based because you can do things without needing capital. Um, uh, but they're also very um, creative in that space, I just feel. And maybe, but also quite fragmented because people are getting together in small groups. I don't know, do you think that's similar in Norway, in Oslo? Is there stuff happening? I'm asking you back a question. Yeah, I wouldn't dare to answer that. <laughs> Um, so that, so in terms of, so that's what I'm talking about gaps really, I'm thinking about, it's not so much that there's a gap in something we haven't investigated, uh, because I think there was so much going on around the queer space, around feminism, around the climate emergency, around, um, you know, uh, recycling and waste, I just feel like there's a huge amount, around um, discrimination, around equality, uh, it, all of these things related to architecture and the built environment, I think there's a huge amount going on, but it feels like it's really struggling to connect um, to the other things going on. But. So we might have uh, time for just one more question. Uh, yes? No, then just following on from the last discussion, then I was wondering how um, also with disordinary architecture, you've sort of found ways to make this sort of also activist practice sustainable. Yeah, that's, uh, and I can answer that one very easily because uh, we only have that, well, we have two rules. One is every, the artists always get paid, so we don't do work if people aren't willing to pay them a proper rate. Uh, which disabled people are always kind of assume that they'll be volunteers or they'll just help you out. You know, they'll tell you what, what to do about your access problems. So that's one rule. And the other rule is that we, yeah, these other protocols about um, the way that we work. 
so that uh, and that's that's it really we don't have an office we uh, and it's across uh, we work internationally but uh, and we work actually with disabled artists in as soon as we can we work with disabled artists in other countries but the artists come from right across the country so all the trains a lot of the train stations come in along the Euston Road in London and there are a lot of um, uh, public buildings along there of different types with different atmospheres which we use as our offices so we basically uh, squat in them and it depends you know who the artists are like there's a Quaker house so it's a very quiet religious place with lots of open space and it's never very full and then there's um, uh, the Welcome Trust which is you know much busier but is also very brilliantly designed as an accessible building um, so that may not answer your question but we do it by being very nomadic basically that's how we do it we do it by not having um, uh, any infrastructure <laughs> which also causes problems but it's um, that's the deal and and whilst I'm in a full-time job the stuff that I do for disordinary uh, my fees go into disordinary and the same with Zoe when there's things that she does you know so we we subsidise it a little by doing other things. We subsidise it from institutions that pay us. But I don't know that that's very helpful. It's just what we do. So I think we have to conclude for today. I'm sorry. Um, Joss will probably be hanging around for a little bit. Yep. If you didn't get a chance to ask her questions, um, you can always come up after. Yep. Uh, thanks again to Joss and uh, for all of you to come yeah thank you that came coming. here today yeah thank you